And welcome to another episode of Mysterious Forces Live. I'm here at DisclosureCon 2019 in Pine Top, Arizona. And obviously, I have Brooks Agnew here with me. Uh, him and I met last year here at DisclosureCon, but became Facebook friends. And I want to talk about a topic that's a little bit different for the show, but I think it's an important topic. Uh, we both appeared on a panel last night, and it was about censorship. And we all talked about censorship. But when I got done with the panel last night, there were some questions that I have and maybe things I wish I had said. And it really sparked a lot of ideas about free speech, First Amendment issues. And uh, the backstory is I apologize to Brooks because uh, I had really kind of spouted off at him because he had expressed his political views on his Facebook page. And uh, I got. Uh, that pushed my buttons and uh, I commented to him in a private message and I just I kind of attacked him and he didn't see it coming and what I did was unfair but I was just kind of had an emotional reaction at that time just due to the politics and the news and as you know if you watch this show <clears throat> I don't do left and right politics on the show so we're not going to have a political debate but I can tell you that him and I I'll bet we have, we certainly have some common things that we would agree on. Mm -hmm. And I'm certain that there are probably a few issues that you and I would have completely opposite political views on. But I want to talk about the importance of the First Amendment and supporting free speech and addressing this idea of uh, censorship, even if it, and even our perception of some censorship of political expression starting to happen in social media. <clears throat> and I just felt like the panel didn't go far enough to get into that, and I just kind of wanted to finish that conversation with you. Well, you know, censorship's been around for a long time, since the Gutenberg Bible. Uh, there have been organizations out there trying to stop information from getting in the hands of, of people. But the great thing about America is we're kind of founded on that idea. We're founded on, you know, the soapbox in the town square. Come, say your piece, and if people resonate with it, that's fine. If they don't, you have the right to say it. What's happened in modern times is we're beginning to do what we call bit burning. We're actually burning digital content from providers who are on their soapbox talking about their issue, whether it's abortion rights or it's uh, immigration rights or whatever it is. Uh, we're, we're burning that digital content so that people cannot hear their voice. That's not American. America is all about expressing your views and then trying to get people to resonate with those views. Right now we have two dominant you know, political parties in our country, but we're set up to allow you know, any political parties to come to power. We may be witnessing the demise of a major political party right now. Certainly the Republicans were eviscerated two years ago. We, we still call them Republicans, but they're not the same Republican Party that we had two years ago. Some people are happy with that change. Some people are not happy with that change. But now we're watching another party that's almost bankrupt. They're bankrupt ideas. They have one uh, uh, platform piece, and that's impeachment. If it resonates with people, great. But if it doesn't, another party will come along. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, it I agree with that. Part of the point that I had thought about last night, and we just we didn't really work this out ahead of time. We just kind of briefly outlined what we wanted to talk about. <clears throat> and I've said this on my show before. If you support the First Amendment, if you really, truly have internalized it and you believe that, then you must support speech that you disagree with, speech that offends you, speech that may be the exact opposite of what you believe spiritually or politically or cult culturally, whatever it may be. But if you don't vigorously support other people's right to express themselves openly and freely without recrimination, then you're really not supporting the First Amendment. And I think, it, I think this is an important message right now because even though you and I had that, and it wasn't like, I don't want to paint a picture like this was a big protracted fight or anything. I, I kind of spewed at him and then he responded like, hey, wow, where'd this come from? And he was really cool about it. And we didn't see each other for a year until we were here. So it's, this was not an ongoing feud. I, I don't even want to suggest that. Um, but we're living in a time of cancel culture 
<clears throat> or if someone says something or does something that there's this idea that that person has to disappear or that their career must oh, be yeah. ended sure. <clears throat> that I mean disappear like in social media deplatformed you know what I mean like yeah. taken off the social scene or like out of the, the public old, uh, eye Attila the Hun uh, uh, philosophy which is that it is not enough to win all others must lose Right, right. And uh, when you and I were sitting up on the stage last night, you know, we talked about we're both fellow Americans. And I, I think the fact that we're fellow citizens transcends our individual differences. Mm -hmm. And that at the end of the day, we have to support each other as Americans, no matter what our politics is. I just wanted to speak to that a little bit because I just think it's important right now. And I think it's part of I think it's an important issue in this community. Um, I, I think part of where this is coming from for me, I came at this really just kind of from paranormal stuff and UFOs. But then as the conspiracy stuff starts to get talked about, ultimately some politics gets pulled into this. And sometimes it's just like the actions of government in general, not specific politics. But then when you start delineating specific examples of something that's been done politically by either party then you start talking politics and <clears throat> I don't know I, I just think we're in a climate right now where we need to kind of pull together and have some common sense between us and not just feed into the divisiveness well you know politics is just the the engine of society uh, whenever we want to get our ideas across we use political discourse we use we use rhetoric um, but when politics uses uh, other tactics like um, the court of public opinion, they personally destroy a person so they can win an argument. That's not politics. That's something else. That's some, some semantical battle that um, even the Pharisees used to use it against the, the disciples. They're not arguing in the arena of ideas then. What they're doing is they're attacking the credibility of that person, the integrity of that person. Mm -hmm. That's not politics. Politics is actually a gracious, uh, beautiful process of elegant communication. Government is the structure of laws by which a society will operate. Some of that's very carefully written so that it's very clear and unambiguous. Politics is, is the art of winning an argument. And although it can be beautiful, like on the you know congressional floor on this the Senate floor, it can also be um, vicious and it can be unfounded and it can go after aspects of the person you're arguing with that are really not fair. So we're not talking about free speech when we take a club to the argument. We're not talking about free speech when you burn someone's car or break their windows. That's not free speech anymore. Free speech is the soapbox and your voice and that's it. And that's all really social media is, is the soapbox and the voice. And if you don't like it, turn it off. That's the way it should be. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Um, I didn't really have a, <clears throat> I had a point to doing this episode. I didn't have an agenda in doing this episode. I just wanted to have this conversation because it sparked so much thought. Uh, that I sat with last night after the panel. I mean, we all went to the VIP party afterwards and we had a blast last night, but it was still all in the back of my mind, just the topic. And uh, really, I guess, maybe if I did have an agenda, it was that showing that people who might be on different ends of the spectrum politically, and maybe not even so different, because I'll, I'll just like divulge right now, I got tired of the Democratic Party, even though you might think I'm part of the LGBT community that I would automatically be a Democrat. That's not true. <clears throat> the Democrats have done enough things to make me not trust the party at all. So the only thing I can be in good conscience is an independent. And, well, and I, I feel like even as a person who leans left, the Democratic Party, they have, they, uh, they have not earned my loyalty in, in the way they have conducted politics. And if, if the Democrats are losing liberal-leaning people, they've got a problem. Yeah, I, I would say uh, political parties cannot exist without a constituency. If they do, it's fascism. Uh, when a political party is so much different than its constituency, one or two things happens. 
a new party is formed or that party reforms. And they've not been very good since 1848 in reformation, but it's about time. Yeah. Do you think there's a place in American politics for a viable, legitimate third party? That's a really good question. Our republic isn't really set up for three parties. Uh, what happens uh, with the republic is we vote and then electors from the states, which are based on congressmen and senators in that state, they're the ones that actually pledge the vote. And this, it's important because it protects the vote of small states like Oklahoma or Tennessee or Kentucky, which they would never even see a presidential candidate if we lived in a pure democracy. But uh, with a third party, what you then end up doing is dividing up the electors to where uh, one party with less than 50% of the vote, like 40 or even 35% of the vote, could win an election. So it would be important if we did have a third party system come about that we amend the Constitution to require one party to have at least 50% of the vote. That's a good idea. What do, what do you think some of the remedies look like? Part of what I'm thinking, too, is that, yes, this is political ideology, but at the same time, I think this is kind of a culture war in America. I don't want to over-sensationalize that. Like, you know, you could easily say we're having kind of a cultural civil war right now. And, and I suppose if you want to give over to hyperbole, you could say that. But I don't really want to paint that picture. I don't think it's that bleak. I think the Civil War was a horrible, uh, perhaps necessary, but a horrible episode in American history. We don't want to see that. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm, we're hoping that we've all evolved to the point where we can find peaceful, political, diplomatic solutions to our problems uh, w without resorting to violence, obviously. No one's endorsing violence. But do you think that this is, do you think this is just a, maybe what's fueling this is kind of a generational push and pull between, and I'm 54, so when I say older folks, I'm kind of talking about me and people older than me. And when I say younger people, I'm thinking maybe more millennials. I have a daughter that's 33. So, you know, I consider that the younger generation. Do you think this is just a cultural back and forth, or do you think it runs deeper? Uh, I don't think it's cultural. I think that what you have is an organization that lost control of the world when America came to power and they kind of gave it its, its chance and then in 1812 they tried to take it down again we fought to a stalemate and then in 1848 the political party changed names and within five years they put the tariff of abominations in place blockaded the south split the nation into two pieces one with 13 states one with seven and that was it america was finished but then a million americans died in a war to put it back together so they lost again and then in 1915, they started a 30-year-long war period. They call it World War I or World War II, but it's actually 30 years of war. By 1945, they'd formed two things. First, a permanent war culture called an industrial military complex. We couldn't get rid of it. We were at war all the time or building war or planning for war. In fact, the worst thing for it was peace. The second thing, though, was even more devastating. And that was in 1933, Roosevelt established what was called the agency government, or a fascist government inside our government. He started with about 50 agencies. Today, we have 650 agencies. And these agencies, departments, bureaus, and administrations write all our laws. They assess all our taxes. They confiscate our stuff. They regulate the crap out of us. But we have no representation in that government. That's of taxation without representation. That's not cultural, that's structural. So now we're to the point where our nation, all ages, realize we've lost control of America. And we're trying to get that control back. But the forces that have taken control of America don't want to give it up. So this is the battle that's going on right now. Now if we reform and we come through it as a nation, that's great. I think one of the solutions might be because today states are about the size that nations used to be. Maybe states adopt a republic form of government as well. Instead of a, a democratic vote inside a state, you have a republic vote inside a state. That way all these gerrymandered counties have an equal vote.
Right. It isn't that way now. Now it's L.A. is California. New York City is New York. Chicago is Illinois. It would allow the smaller communities to have representation in their own state government. That could be a reform that would work. Yeah. No. Yeah. No, I like the idea of that. Um, do you think... Well, I, I'm wondering... If anyone's really paying attention, if anyone follows his work, you probably already know by now that his politics leans right, mine leans left. And without going down that rabbit hole, as a conservative, do have you seen anything going on in conservative politics that troubles you? I'm not even getting into specifics. I mean, just, just like I'm able to talk about where the left is going wrong. Do you see troubling signs of anything in the world of conservative politics that troubles you? Yeah, I do. Because, you know, when our current president uh, won or, and actually you know, started his campaign, it split the Republican Party. We had like 40 Republicans retire, and that's on a federal level. On a state level, we had even more than that. New Republicans came in, and it has created a kind of dual community. We have conservatives inside there, which I wouldn't say are right-leaning or left-leaning, but then we have a kind of go-along to get-along part of the Republican Party. They haven't maybe made as much money as they want to make yet. I think the big mistake is that we have created a system that allows our lawmakers, both congressmen and senator, to make themselves rich personally and their families wealthy beyond measure while in government. That's a big problem. And I think the Republicans are just as guilty as the Democrats. Yeah. Um, I was speaking to a friend of yours earlier and, and I was talking about how much I disagree with so much corporate money going into uh, politics. I think uh, the money has been harmful. Sure. Um, I would rather see it kept amongst voters and uh, it, voters being the patrons of politicians that are running for office rather than being beholden to any corporate money on either side. And if you I think term limits would really help that. If we limited congressmen to 12 years and maybe senators to 18 years, you wouldn't have these 30 year long dynasties that are actually corporations in and among themselves. They have, they have layers of foundations that they can move uh, influence money back and forth for the pharmaceutical companies, for the oil companies, for power companies, and it's billions of dollars. And these politicians, they just can't resist it. So let's limit their amount of time they can stay in it, and let's limit the amount of money they can spend. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, where do you fall with states' rights? What, what do you think about the balance between the federal government's responsibilities, where that starts and ends, versus states' rights? That's a whole other interview, but, 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 but overall, what has happened is exactly what the Founding Fathers feared. Once we formed a central government with overarching power, uh, they would be able to apply that power and cover all the states. And the Supremacy Clause, although it's kind of ambiguous in the Constitution, it basically means federal law trumps state law. Um, that's a big problem. And that's why the Convention of States is so valuable. The Article 5 Convention allows states, to, 34 states, to come together and form their own convention and amend the Constitution if the federal government gets too far out of control. I think a lot of people know the federal government's way out of control. But now I think we only have 24 states. We need 34 to actually call the convention. We've had uh, three uh, mock conventions. We have delegates in all 50 states. I wrote Alienated Nation in 2012. It sold about 45,000 copies, but today we have over 3 million people involved in the movement. So if we can get this convention to happen, we can make those amendments, then they go back to 38 states to be ratified, and if those amendments pass, Congress has to live by them because the Supreme Court will rule on them. Absolutely. This will probably be the most pointed question that I'll ask. And it, um, I'll give you latitude to answer this your way. How can we strike a balance between personal responsibility and what responsibility 
either local, state, or federal government might have in uh, helping to care for its citizens, whether that be health care, uh, a net of uh, social services for people who are disabled, whatever. I mean, there's a broad spectrum. How do we balance personal responsibility versus the responsibility of government to take care of its citizens? This is a really good question. Uh, the number of people in the United States that have an, a pre-existing condition or a handicap of some kind where they're going to require health care for life, that uh, isn't really covered by insurance. In fact, that that's not really insurance. Insurance is kind of a, a risk policy that says, okay, you're healthy now, but you might get sick in the future, so we'll charge you a little bit now for bills that might come in the future, and you get a large population to pay for a few sick people that are sick every now and then. But in order to take care of just the people that have pre-existing conditions and handicaps, you're talking about $80 billion, $90 billion, and that would do it. However, that group has been used as a cudgel to force into creation what's called single payer. Mm -hmm. This is the ultimate in fascism. If we're good at anything in this nation, it's healthcare. Our healthcare is the best the planet has ever seen, but it's not as good as it could be because we don't allow enough competition. If insurance companies could compete over state lines, Prices would go down, quality would go up, because we would do the choosing, just like with car insurance. That's why we don't have one progressive company, we don't have one Geico, we don't have one Liberty. People can pick and choose, and the companies have to advertise for that business, and they have to change plans and policies so that people, you know, meets their needs. Not everybody thinks a Cadillac is quality. Some people want a Jeep, some people want a, you know, a, an Altima. That's quality to them. You let the people choose and the system will get better. As soon as government does the choosing, the whole thing will go to hell. Yeah, no, I get that. So, I know that you're going to be speaking soon. You're the kind of the keynote speaker for tonight. He's going to close Disclosure Con. And in the spirit of this conversation, in the conversation that we've had privately, I'm going to just give you the microphone. And uh, in terms of the context of this conversation, this topic, what would, what would you say to people watching and listening? What would your overall message on this be? Wow, that's a, that's a really good question. I, I would say that if you really wanted to make yourself aware of something that could really make a difference, and I mean make a difference this year, I would make yourself familiar with the Convention of States. Go to cosaction.com, cosaction.com. It's free to sign up. Join in with your state, write letters, make phone calls, go to rallies, learn about what the uh, Article 5 Convention is in the Constitution and what your rights are to amend that Constitution to remove the uh, out the, the, the overreaching power that the federal government has asserted over the last few years. In fact, one of the amendments they want to do is to repeal the 16th Amendment. That's the income tax. Once that goes away, then the, the, the federal government has to collect taxes off of sales or revenue. It's called a use tax. It's what states do right now. And a lot of states don't have income taxes. They have uh, use taxes. And they are the fastest growing states in the country because it's all based on revenue instead of how much you make. I feel, and I'm sure you agree, I don't think the federal government has any right what we earn or what we save. They have no right to know that whatsoever. They do have a right to tax our money when we spend it. And rich people spend a hell of a lot more than I do, so they'll pay more taxes. And uh, those are my feelings. Oh, no, that's great. Um, is that a nonpartisan organization? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I'll look into that. Um, I'm interested in that. So we'll talk about that off camera. But uh, I just wanted to do this conversation, have this conversation, rather, uh, just out of the spirit of uh, free exchange. And uh, I, I just happen to think a lot about, you know, how easy it is to be reactionary online or to kind of have you know kind of have an emotional knee-jerk reaction to something and uh, you can say something to someone and it doesn't mean you're right when you do that and I really had to analyze what I had said to him and what it really meant and then uh, being on the panel with him last night kind of brought that all back up to the surface so uh, I just kind of wanted to finish that conversation I felt like there was more to say on this but uh, I appreciate you coming on, and I, 
I'd like to encourage everyone watching to consider having rational conversations like this with people. You may think you disagree with them, but maybe you don't, and maybe you'll find some commonality. And I think of fellow Americans of uh, any political flavor start having more reasonable conversations with each other. We might be able to work out solutions amongst ourselves sure. and not have to rely on the federal government to come and fix everything, which none of us want. So, Brooks Agnew. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having this conversation. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching Mysterious Forces Live, Disclosure Con 2019. If you haven't already hit that like button, please do so. If you haven't subscribed, what's wrong with you? Please subscribe. And if you like the video, share this video. Talk about it amongst your friends and uh, think about what we talked about. And figure out for yourself where you stand and what it is you stand for based on information and data that you have gotten yourself, not just what anyone tells you to believe on TV. So think for yourself, folks. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again on Mysterious Forces Live. Good job. Perfect. Thank you.